This lesson goes through sections 1.6 and 1.7 in your algebra textbook and covers the topic of functions. So to start with, we need to understand what the word function means in the context of math. Read the statements below and try and infer what the word function means. First, your score on a test is a function of how hard you study. Then, your fuel mileage is a function of how fast you drive and how heavy your car is. Third, the price of lemons is a function of rainfall in Florida. In all of these cases, that phrase is a function of could be replaced with the phrase depends on. So we could say your score in a test depends on how hard you study. Your fuel mileage depends on how fast you drive and how heavy your car is. The price of lemons in Florida de sorry, the price of lemons depends on the rainfall in Florida. So in math, a function means that one quantity depends on another. We use something called function notation, which is actually one of the more confusing things in algebra this year. So let's step through how it works. We had a sentence, your score on a test is a function of how hard you study. We might shorten that to a slightly math-ish looking thing. Score on test equals f of how hard you study. Notice this isn't a variable f times how hard you study. That little f there stands for is a function of. So your score on a test equals a function of how hard you study. We could do the same thing with the price of lemons is a function of, is f of rainfall in Florida. In math, mostly we're going to deal with an output variable, y, that depends on, or is a function of, an input variable, x. We would express this by writing y equals f of x. And again, it isn't f times x. That f means is a function of, or depends on, x. We often use the letter f to denote a particular function, but we might sometimes be working with multiple different functions at once, in which case we could use another letter, like g, to denote a different function. So in this case, y equals g of x. g is just a different function. In this case, y depends in a different way on what x is. We need some definitions when we're talking about functions. First off, a function is a rule that relates inputs and outputs. There's going to be something special about the inputs and outputs for a function. The inputs to a function are called the domain. In math, these are going to be the numbers that we plug in for x. The outputs of the function, the numbers that the function spits out, are called the range. And in math, we'll typically track these with the y values. So what is it that makes a function so very special? Well, each input, each individual input, has exactly one output. It doesn't have zero outputs, and it doesn't have more than one output. It has exactly one output. If you put the same number into a function, you'll always get the same thing out. There's never any randomness or guessing as to what the output's going to be. Next time you're in class, ask Mrs. Dever to show you Old Reliable, her function machine. We have a couple different ways we can picture functions, and one is with tables. We're going to use a table to keep track of the numbers we put into a function, the x values, and the numbers we get out, y. So in this case, if I put in a 1 into my function, it spits out a 2. If I put in a 3, it spits out a 6. You might have an idea what the rule is for this function. Maybe it's doubling the value. If I put in a 4, it spits out an 8. This is a table that shows the inputs and outputs for a particular function. This table is representing a function because each of the inputs, 1, 3, and 4, has exactly one output that goes with it. What if we added another entry into this table? What if the next time I come along I put in a 5? I'm expecting to get out a 10 based on what I think the rule is, and instead I get out an 11. Even though this is strange, this is still a function. Each individual input still has exactly one output. There's no case where I put the same number in twice in a row and get different things out. What about if I did this? What if I started with the same beginning and then I put in a 5 and I get out an 8? 
Now does this table represent a function? It still does. It's okay for two different inputs to match to the same output. So both 4 and 5 could have an output of 8. That's okay. It's still true that each input, 1, 3, 4, and 5, has exactly one output that matches it. So this is still a function. What if I started with the same stem again, and now I come along and I put in a 4 again. I've already put a 4 into this function once, and I got an 8 out. In order for this relation to be a function, I have to get an 8 out every single time I put a 4 in. No guessing. No worrying what it's going to be. But this time I get out an 11. The next time I come along and put a 4 into this function, what am I going to get out? Am I going to get out an 8 or an 11 or something else? I don't know. This is not a function. The input 4 is currently matched to two different outputs. It's matched to both 8 and 11. So one input has two outputs here, and that's not okay. Another way we can show this is something called a mapping diagram. For a mapping diagram, we show the set of numbers that represents the input, and we typically put them in order from smallest to biggest. If a number is input multiple times, we don't list it multiple times. This is simply the set of numbers that we are allowed to input, and we can use any of them multiple times. Then we show the set of outputs. These are the numbers we get out from our function. And we use arrows to connect which input goes with which output. Again, if a number shows up multiple times in the input or multiple times in the output, in a mapping diagram, I'm only going to list it once. So here's the second table that I showed you on the previous slide converted into a mapping diagram. Again, you can see each input, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, only maps to exactly one output. Next, this is the third table I showed you on the previous slide. Notice that in that table, the number 8 showed up twice as an output, but here it's only once. But the input of 4 maps to the output of 8, and the input of 5 also maps to the output of 8. It is still true that each input, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, each of those only goes to one output. It happens to be that 4 and 5 go to the same output, but that's okay. Last, this is a mapping diagram for the last table I showed you. Notice that in this case, we input 4 twice. 4 only shows up once on our list of possible inputs in the mapping diagram. But we show that the first time we put it in, it mapped to an output of 8, and the second time, it mapped to an output of 11. We can tell from looking at this that this last yellow function here, or this last yellow relation, is not a function because the input of 4 has two different outputs. Identifying the domain and range of a function is actually suspiciously easy when we're given a mapping diagram or a table. The domain is simply the list of numbers that we put in. And the range is simply the list of numbers we get out. There's really nothing more to it than that. We can very often, and in math we will very often, write rules to go with our function. This is like a set of instructions for how to turn the input into the output. Sometimes we might describe these rules verbally. As x goes up by 1, y goes up by 3. We might say that the output is 3 more than the input. Or you might have a word problem that has a function rule described in it. For example, each degree increase in ocean temperature causes a one foot rise in sea level. That relates the input, ocean temperature, to the output, sea level. Oftentimes, we'll turn these verbal rules into equations. So the equation that goes with that first ver verbal rule is y equals 3 times x. So if I increase x by 1, y is going to go up by 3. The rule that goes with the second, equi or the second verbal rule there is y equals x plus 3. The output is always 3 more than the input. One last way we have to picture functions is with graphs. So if you remember, if you look back on the tables that you had, the first table showed x and y pairs that were input-output pairs. 
you can turn each of those input-output pairs into an x-y coordinate that tells you where a point is. So in the graph shown above here, each point has coordinates that can be found in the table. The first point is 1, 2. The next point is 3, 6, then 4, 8, then 5, 11. Next, we'll show one of the other tables converted into a graph. This is an example of what the graph would look like when we put two different numbers in for x, that's 4 and 5, but got the same number out for y. Notice that on this graph, we have two points that are at the same height on the graph. Their y coordinates are the same, but their x coordinates are different. These are both functions. If, however, I graph the table that was not a function, the table where the first time I put in a 4, I got out an 8, so the point 4, 8 is on the graph. And the second time I put in a 4, I get out an 11, so the point 4, 11 is also on the graph. What this means is that I have two points with the same x-coordinate, 4, 8 and 4, 11. Those two points stack right on top of each other in this graph. We say that this graph fails something called the vertical line test. The vertical line test says that if anywhere along the graph of a function you can draw a straight up and down line and it crosses more than one point on that graph, that that graph does not represent a function because you have two points with the same x-coordinate, that is the same input, but different y-coordinates, different output. This next section goes through an example 3 in section 1.7 in your book and it asks us to write a rule for the function that's represented by the graph and then to identify the domain and range. So here's a graph that has a number of different points on it. And the question is, what's the rule that turns the inputs, the x-coordinates, into the outputs? Well, it might be helpful if we make a table first. So we notice that the first point on this graph has coordinates 1, 2, or an x-value of 1 and a y-value of 2. And you can see that we've added in all of the rest of the points on that graph. Now I notice in this case that the y value is always one more than the x value. y is always x plus one. So that's a rule that goes with that table. y equals x plus one. So that's a rule that goes with it. The domain of the function is the x coordinates of the points that we saw, and the range is the y coordinates of the points we saw. Here's a different function. In this case, we have some points that are sort of heading downhill, and we're looking for a rule that relates the inputs and outputs and identifying the domain and range. So in this case, if we go through the same process where we create a table and then we look for some patterns, we find that the y-coordinate is 5 minus the x-coordinate. So as the x-coordinate gets bigger, the y-coordinate gets smaller and the domain and range are shown there. They are simply the x-coordinates of those points and the y-coordinates of those points. And we'll continue to work with this once we get into chapters 4 and 5. We'll learn better some strategies for coming up with the rule that goes with those points. Right now you're sort of guessing and checking.